Um, so I'm uh, introducing the speakers for today's uh, afternoon security session. Um, why'd you run away, Yaron? Oh, oh okay. I'm starting. I'm starting. <laughs> Yaron, Yaron Salander is a principal researcher at Ericsson Research, and he has a master's degree in acoustic physics from Stockholm University and a PhD in mathematics from the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. Yoram has over 20 years of experience with security research and standardization and last 10 years of the focus on cyber physical systems. I know him from ITF meetings, many, many of them, and he's always been an absolute fabulous uh, presenter and knows his shit. So give him a warm welcome. Thanks, Michael. I don't think that was true at all, but uh, let's let's try to do my, my best here today. So I'm Yoram Salanda from Ericsson. And I'm going to apologize starting with two things. Uh, is the volume right? Okay. So, uh, so first of all, I'm going to talk about IPF standards. And this is not really news. So if you are following standardization, um, you may know a lot of this. And secondly, this could be really boring when talking about standards. So I, you should probably think about something else. You should probably think about you have an your favorite device and with the right operating system, obviously. And you have uh, added the modules for CBOR uh, for encoding some data and COSI for, for protecting the data and co-op for transporting the COSI objects, like in suit, for example. And um, you're, you, you would ask the question, okay, I have this stuff. What, what can I do with it? Why, why do I need to have any other security protocols. I basically have the encoding, the security, and the transport. So, so that's the question. What can we do by building lightweight security standards on CBOR, COSI, and COAP? And another way to, to formulate this is um, we all know that there is a large variety of, of things. These are obvious things I'm, I'm writing on this slide. Um, some devices are not constrained. Most are not constrained, but some, some devices and networks are constrained, and we need to handle that. Uh, so on the one hand side, there's a large variation, but on the other hand, there is a lot of common security requirements. So what we really want to, to do is often to do the secure onboarding, authentication, authorization, to establish keys and to stop secure communication, but we don't... Uh, we want also to compensate for this, this variety of things. So there is a desire, in, if you are working for a company which are working in, in multiple industries and in different application setups, you'd like to be able to deploy a set, a set of generic standards, preferably a, a small number, and that works in different industries, but also in particular for the low end, for enabling of good performance and code reuse and, and um, competence and so on. So that's the starting point. And uh, I've already revealed what I think are perhaps a good basis for these common generic standards. So let's just go ahead. Starting point, uh, if you're looking at in particular for application layer security is that you start with CBOR, which I think you're all very familiar with. It's a binary version of, of JSON. And you find this in in a lot of the ongoing work in, in the ITF, particularly in IT standards, like for re remote attestation and software identification and suit, as I mentioned. And given that you have uh, CBOR encoded data, you also um, generally use the COSI, um, um, yeah, I mean the COSI sing sign, COSI encrypt, and all these uh, security wrappers which is the analog of JSON web objects. But this is not the only uh, type of protocols using, using Seaborn and COSI. We uh, have also protocols like OSCOR, ad hoc, which I'll talk more about later, and also things like hybrid public key encryption with COSI. So that's the sort of the encoding part is, is pretty straightforward. And now I'm gonna move on to the third candidate protocol in this section, I will talk about how we protect co-op with existing RFCs. And then in the next section, I will talk about future work and ongoing work on ongoing standardization work. 
So some recap, this is also known to most of you, I think, co-op has a base specification, which has this restful design um, with methods, URIs and content type. And there is um, a, a corresponding to this, uh, the request response layer. And there is also this underlying messaging layer, which has the UDP binding. In the same specification, there is the DTLS binding, the proxy and caching capabilities. Now, other features are, are defined in separate specifications, such as the group communications, notifications, fragmentations, and so on. And in particular, looking at the group communications, that is something which is an experimental RFC. It didn't contain any security um, solution, so it's being updated. Uh, and that's uh, one of the reasons I'm going to, uh, that's one of the reasons this is ongoing work. So how do we protect uh, co-op messages? Um, oh, let's first take an example. This, I mean, this is also a very basic example. You are, want to get the status of an alarm. So you do get to slash status, which maps to a uh, co-op message with a certain code and a certain URI path. And you get back the content, which maps to content uh, code and, and certain payload. And this is the analog for, for actuators. And this is actually a uh, picture where you would like to do find five errors um, because there are so many things that can go wrong here. We all know about problems with freshness and replay protection of actuators. But there are also, are also more subtle things like, for example, so in this example, there was nor payload one indicated normal operation. Let's assume that we can decouple the binding between a request and response so that you can send the response normal operation during a, a break-in, for example, when you, have, um, when you have neutralized the alarm. I don't, I'm not gonna talk about this right now, but this is, this is really an interesting area and there is some work uh, done and some work ongoing in the linked drafts at the bottom. So now moving on to protecting co-op, we look at the same example as the previous slide with the get status. And now we have added some more message fields to illustrate what uh, data is being changed uh, in, in by, by proxy. So in this case, we have the, the rest layer, the dark blue fields, and we have the messaging um, and binding layer uh, in light blue fields. And you see that, uh, uh, messaging layer is doing this reliability uh, operations with con configurable um, confirmable messages and you also have the message identifier being changed by the proxy so uh, probably stupid question is what do you need to protect in this uh, in this message and there are different approaches here one obvious approach is that you protect the whole co-op message and that's what transport layer security is doing and that means that the, the proxy, the fields intended for the proxy are not visible. So you need to decrypt and re-encrypt at the proxy. And, and the other uh, approach or one other approach is that you focus on the rest data instead. So you protect uh, the rest data end to end between client and server. And this allows proxy operations to perform as normal. And in fact, the packet becomes independent of transport. And that's the approach of OSCOR. So uh, you see in the figure at the bottom left here is the, uh, the different layers where transport layer security and, and rest layer are applied. So with this in mind, uh, we take a look at how OSCOR is protecting co-op and uh, OSCOR is then building uh, out of co-op and COSI, so two of the uh, building blocks, uh, which I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, and the process is pretty straightforward. You take, although it might look complicated, so you take an unprotected co-op message. Um, some of the headers are classified as encrypted and those you uh, put on one side and you take the unprotected headers on the other side. And the protected headers uh, are formatted as a co-op message. Uh, so you use co-op serialization and uh, that becomes the inner message, which is then wrapped into COSI. So you encrypt the inner message in the COSI encrypt zero, and you compress the, uh, the headers and put into an, uh, an OSCOR option, 
together with the ciphertext as payload that builds out the outer message, which is the protected co-op message that you send with co-op. So that's using both uh, co-op and cozy as uh, as building blocks here. Sorry, computer. And if given that you have communication security and an encryption of of an integrity protection of the data, you may also want to add authorization and access control. And uh, there is a recent publication uh, on on that. That's the ACE OAuth framework. Uh, which is building on the same building block, Seaborg, Cozy, and Co-op, but also adding OAuth 2.0. So you're having the, the, basically the OAuth framework with the client resource server authorization server. Resources are hosted on, on the resource server. And um, you are uh, the, uh, the client, in order to access the resource server, needs to, to get an access token. And uh, using this access token, which contains a POP, Sorry, it contains a pop uh, key, uh, which is associated to the access rights. The client can authenticate to the resource server and thereby prove it's entitled to these, these privileges. So that, that ends the background presentation on uh, how, how we protect co-op today and existing RFCs. And now I'd like to step into the group communication part And this isn't working anymore. Things aren't really working anymore. Going forward goes fine. Ah, that works. Um, so group communication is really interesting. It's been around for a long time in the core working group. Um, there was this experimental RFC, but there were no security specified. And uh, it's, it, it has a good potential to, to improve performance very well in, in, in very many use cases. So for example, it could be more efficient bandwidth use and reduce latency and so on. And there are multiple use cases here, uh, like building automation, industrial control. So the idea, idea is that you have a provider and you have a consu multiple consumers and the provider is um, uh, providing with the consumer with the same content. And there are in the core working group, basically two uh, setups for how to handle uh, multicast or group communication. One is the, the core, the group combis draft on the left, which is based on a multicast request with the uh, um, unicast responses. And uh, then there is on the right-hand side, the pool model, which is uh, unicast registrations for multicast notifications. So the basic idea here is that uh, one node is communicating with many, but the individual, but it's not like all, uh, all devices are communicating with each other. And the obvious um, question is now, how do we secure uh, this setting? I should also mention here that, co that proxies has a natural role in this architecture. So for example, in the left-hand side, and the client may not be in the network of the server, so you may need a proxy which translates uh, to, to multicast request and, uh, and also forwards the responses back. And in the, in the right hand side, proxies are also important because, uh, for example, to cache multicast notifications, which provides also good, good bandwidth use. And, and so, so the security in in, uh, in uh, group communication is divided in two parts. And we start with encryption, meaning encryption integrity protection. And it turns out that uh, uh, OSCORE can be reused directly in this setting. And for, for multiple reasons, the security works in the presence of proxies. And uh, there's special nonce construction in the OSCORE uh, use of the COSI encrypt, which separates the non-space such that you can use it also for, for, um, for any number of, of devices. So in non OSCORE is based on a shared secret scheme, uh, which means that all the nodes needs to have the same secret and they also need to have uh, key identifiers in their sender context. 
and how we get those in place it's, it's a second uh, we we'll come back to it later so uh, there's supposed to be some animation here yeah so so you have given the secret and and, and the key identifier uh, a node can derive a key which is used to to produce this message so the client produces sender key it sends um, and uh, together with this key identifier the recipient uh, receive the key identifier they can derive the same key to verify the message and they can send back their identifiers which are then allows the, the client to um, derive the uh, corresponding security context and verify the messages so this works fine within a group but in the sense that no one outside the group would, uh, would be able to read um, or uh, manipulate the message, but it doesn't provide source authentication. So that's a separate. So there, there are two, two things to explain here. How do we do source authentication and how do we get the keys in place? And source authentication is done using asymmetric keys. And there are two different modes. One mode is called group mode. And that's using signatures. So the message is being sent is signed and using a construction in COSI called COSI countersign. And so that's basically just adding a signature to the COSI encrypt message. And this, of course, requires that each node has their own private public key pair. And uh, the receiver also needs to have the public key of, uh, of the sender. And, and this, if, if anyone is communicating with everyone, of course, you need to have a lot of keys. But in many common settings, there are, for example, if you think about thermostats, communicating with thermostats in a building automation scenario, um, then each thermostat only needs to have the public key of, of the controller. So that was group mode. And given that you have these uh, keys in place, you could use them for also for Diffie-Hellman, and that's the pairwise mode. So it's like hybrid public key encryption. You uh, take your own private key and the public key of the party you want to communicate with. You generate the Diffie-Hellman shared secret, which is only known to this pair. And then you include that in the OSCOR key derivation. And that creates um, a pairwise key used with OSCOR. And, and some, uh, a nice thing here is that the same key pair can actually be used in both modes, which is not obvious from a security point of view, but there are security proofs uh, referenced. Uh, so now applying this to the two models, the push and pull model, we, we see that uh, for the push model, it makes sense to use the group mode for, for the request, where we sign the message, but for the pairwise modes, which are multiple messages, uh, sorry, for the request responses, there are multiple messages and there, the signature is, is larger than, than a Mac, so it makes sense that we use a Mac instead to save bandwidth. Whereas in the multicast notification case, it's the reverse. Uh, so you make registrations using unicast, and this could be plain unicast OSCOR, and then the group mode is used in the responses. Okay, so that was how we do source authentication in what's called group OSCOR. And now let's talk a little bit about how to get the group keys in place. It's both the shared secret and the public keys of the other nodes you communicate with. So, and, and this I'm gonna be really short, it's only one figure here. And, and, and the next slide is basically just references to how this is done. This is a quite a mature work. A lot of work has been done on, on the group security life cycle starting with how an admin is configuring a node to be a, a group manager, how this group manager is included in, in a resource directory, and how a candidate member of the group can contact the, the group member, or first contact the resource directory, get the link to join. And then when you join, a request to join using the authorization scheme that we talked about previously, the ACE OAuth authorization scheme, you get back the key material. And when you have the key material, you can do the group communication. So this is all, um, and in, yeah, there is, there is an already drafts here to indicate that you could build, build a lot uh, around this. And uh, so now we turn to 
another use of, of COSI and CBOR, which is the security handshake. So we already have um, means to provision the, the keys for OSCore, in, for example, using the ASO auth framework. But uh, there is also uh, a good principle when it comes to establishing shared secrets uh, that you need to have certain good security properties, which comes out of Diffie-Hellman key exchange. And that's what we call the security handshake or, or uh, authenticated handshake, uh, authenticated key exchange, sorry. And there is a working group in the ITF called Lightweight Authenticated Key Exchange, which is working on this. And there, the work item is called ad hoc ephemeral Diffie-Hellman over COSI. I think you're very familiar with this. I'm just noting uh, some of the properties. Uh, messages are in, in the ad hoc uh, model are CBOR sequences and uh, COSI is used for crypto identification of authentication credentials. So for example, um, we're using COSI Encrypt 0 and COSI Sign 1. The crypto algorithms are identified using COSI and you can handle future algorithms and so on. There is also a way to identify authentication credentials using COSI. Uh, in particular, you could use uh, CBOR web tokens, which is a, uh, a nice compact way of representing credentials, uh, or X509, which is the traditional way. And finally, uh, there is something called CBOR encoded X509, uh, which I'll come to later. And these credentials may be either uh, identified by reference or by value. Ad hoc is uh, specified to be using co-op as default transport, which provides all the reliability aspects and also some denial of service uh, functions. Uh, I think I'll skip this message. This is just going into detail how ad hoc works and some sizes of, of messages. And the last point uh, here on, in my presentation is on, on the CBOR encoded X509 certificates. So now we have tried to remove uh, uh, to try to remove every other encoding and only use CBOR. But if we are stuck with certificates, then we have the ASN1 encoding. Uh, let, and this was motivated, if you remember, by, by introducing public keys. OSCORE is not using uh, public keys, so this, uh, this came with ad hoc. And here is a, uh, a way to get away with, uh, uh, to avoid ASN1 encoding, basically using a CBOR encoding of the X509. And uh, this is supporting a large set of profiles. And the, the main interesting point here, I think, is um, that there are two different types of encodings of CBOR certificates, or C509, uh, which they're called. And one is that you actually take a, an X509 certificate and you re-encode it as CBOR, but you maintain the signature as it was on the original X509. And, uh, and that is nice because it, it is backward compatible with existing CAs. But it means that you need, uh, this is also nice if you, as a device, if you send this certificate away, if you don't have to parse it yourself, then you have a, a small over, you can only, you can send a basically a compressed certificate. But if you are receiving uh, a compressed certificate, that's nice uh, on, on, uh, from a bandwidth point of view, but you need to, uh, uh, re-encode it as ASN1 to verify the signature. And for that reason, there is an, another type called type 0, which is identical to the type 1, but it differs in the signature, which is directly over the CBOR encoding instead of the ASN1. So when, when CAs start to offer uh, CBOR encoded certificates, or if you have your own CA, then, you, then that's much more efficient to use. Uh, and here are some numbers. Now we're getting down into, yeah, 140 bytes of size for a certificate. And I don't think I need to go, to, go through that. Here is the one, the, the 139 byte example, which you could put in seaboard.me if you want to look more into details. And that's it. That's my summary. And uh, I don't think, uh, that would surprise anyone. So I go to this slide directly. <laughs> so thank you very much for having me.
<laughs> Questions? Oh, wait, wait. Uh, it's also about, I mean, compressing the, the, the certificates, right? The recording and process. Okay. Recording uh, completed. Uh, compressing the certificates, um, X509 certificates. And I'm wondering whether you see any potential to actually also make use of it in the real internet, not in the constrained IoT internet, but also on laptop and so on. I mean, the typical web uh, ecosystem, because there we have a lot of... Um, unsmart deployment of certificates that makes them large and uh, yes yeah, so yes there are there are some examples of that i can't remember off the top of my head exactly there are some examples motivating that yeah, okay. in the draft exactly this and uh, there have been there have been some requests from the non-constrained part of the world right. who say, want to want to try this out yeah so yes that's okay um but there are such examples but i can't i can't i, I don't remember no, no, off, the, no, off the top no, of my head okay. but yes great there are cases when Fragmentation is a problem, and you right, so right. soon. Exactly. Indeed, and this—I mean, this is the type one uh, certificate. It's it's one. It's a non um, lossless compression. So so there is not nothing. It's only actual conversion you can do, and you can do it uh, like a, a a box in the wire. So the CA doesn't have to be involved, really. It's just uh, mechanical. In, in comparison with the type zero, where the, the CA needs. I don't think I'm okay. It works. Any other questions? I guess we'll go on to the next speaker. Very good.